Thank you, Lord, for this incredible time together. We know that as we gather around the gospel of Jesus Christ, our lives are forever changed. Thank you, God, that as I share the word today, it cuts to the heart of people's fears, disappointments, struggles, trials, ministers' life, hope, healing, wisdom and deliverance like never before. We, we ask you, Lord, speak to us. Holy Spirit, use me, not just to speak a, a word, but to actually share a rhema, living supernatural word in season today. I thank you that people who are far from their purpose, living lost, living hopeless, living in despair, today will hear a word that will bring them closer to Jesus, ignite their faith in this living God and set them on a path of victory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Redemption, it's so good to see you. I really believe today's gonna bless you. And I, I, I am asking the Holy Spirit today to allow me to minister this word with the excitement and the weight that I have for you. Today, we are finishing up our hope series. And um, it's interesting because I felt like we needed to touch on so many things. I felt like, you know, we could preach on hope for my city and hope for my nation. We could speak on hope for my, my, my hurts. And there's so many things we can minister hope into. But actually, I feel what needs ministry to seal off our pandemic of hope series is to speak to faith. I'm not talking about faith in a doctrine. I'm talking about when you package your walk with God, I wanted to speak hope for my faith. Why? I really believe at the moment people are almost faithless. And I don't mean they don't have a religion. I mean, they're living in such discouragement and despair that we right now are in such a living, almost darkness, heaviness. And I don't, I don't even just talk about, you know, the world. I even think the church right now of Jesus Christ is under such attack. And the attack isn't about enemies and weapons and, you know, what you think. The attack is to literally give up, to walk away, to say I failed, to say I can't do this. <laughs> Our church has been a miracle. It's been a testimony, but it hasn't been perfect. Every single person can take the year 2020 and already list all the failures, all the fears, all the disappointments, all the things that have come unhinged, all the things that haven't gone according to plan. Even in my life, I find my flesh amidst the success, you could say, or amidst being content with how we as a church have literally 180 degreed as a staff, as a team, gone in the middle of this lockdown and brought light in the darkness and brought sermons and gone into different languages and nations and territories. In the midst of that, even myself, I find myself ha having really dark, despairing moments where I feel like giving up. I think the devil right now is trying to rob us of our faith. And I'm gonna to explain to you what I mean by that. So don't switch off and go, oh, he has a sermon on faith. What about a sermon on grace? No. In fact, there's no such differentiation in scripture. When people responded to who Jesus is, and then once he died, what he had done for them, and then became believers in him. So even people who got healed by Jesus before he died, he even... He even recognizes their faith. I'm not talking about attending a temple, a building. I'm not talking about a tradition of religion. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with consistency. And in fact, this year, I, I believe people who have been consistent in receiving the word, in being intentional with their walk with the Lord, they've been stronger than others. But I'm saying this, if you reflect today and maybe you sense you can't do this, maybe you sense you're struggling with your faith. I'm talking about your belief. I'm talking about your optimism. And I am talking about your foundation. I, I feel we have been shaken to the core around the world and we are seeing all over the world 
people of prominence, people of stature, people of success being shaken to their core. Don't, this is not a political statement. This is not a church statement. This is not about gossip. This is about the reality that humanity is experiencing a, a shaking. And even in your life, I think you're challenged. I'm sure maybe it's just me. We're waking up and we're being confronted with, do we have what it takes? Is this how I can go on? And even in my life, I found myself lacking a certain faith. And I want to speak to you today because I believe God has a word on how to literally ignite faith in your life. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a renewed strength. See, when we look at our faith and we contextualize ourselves in the story of our faith, we place ourselves in faith, like I am going to do this, do this, do this. I am going to achieve this, achieve that, achieve this. We are robbing ourselves of what God wants to give us through actual faith as what is called faith in scripture. We also are burdening ourselves and we are limiting ourselves and we are placing a limited resource, which is us. And let's be honest, I don't know about you, but 2020 has exposed to me my limitations more than any other year, has exposed to me my weaknesses more than any other year. Um, it's almost too much. Uh, and it's like when you place a limited resource in the position to function as an unlimited resource, wow, things, things get bad really quick. Uh, you can go into deep depression, burnouts, you get suicidal thoughts, you get destructive patterns. And Now here's the thing, if this is where you are, you just need to find how to shift your faith in the right place. What is faith, what isn't faith as scripture describes it? and leave here today full of hope because your faith will be repositioned where it needs to be on your Lord and Savior, our Savior. You know, for me, even what is church is getting challenged. And I, I have to tell you, I cannot wait till we can gather together as a church. In South Africa, in Netherlands, and all other nations, we are hard at work planning and praying that we will be able to start gathering as the saints in January 2021. Of course, I don't know for certain what governments will decide, what restrictions will be, but we are planning to gather again as the saints. But for me, so much of what is it that church is to us is getting challenged because I feel like for some of us, our faith has been in, in certain things that it doesn't need to be in. I was saying to our dream team here in South Africa the other night that I'm passionate about occupying buildings, but what I felt God say to me is a building is just an empty room. If you look at the Old Testament, they would have literally empty rooms and buildings until the Ark of the Covenant occupied it. When the Ark occupied a building, it went from a building to the house of God. Literally, the place his presence rested. And for me, the ark is a picture, as we know, of Jesus. And why I'm passionate about gathering in buildings again is that we get to gather around Jesus. And also next year, we're obviously planning to stay online and take that to another level so that people who can't attend with us physically have an even better experience worshiping with us through technology. But how much of our faith has been changed this year? How much of what we had faith in? For some of you, your faith was in cryptocurrency. And I don't even know. I think that changes every five seconds. And for some of you, your faith was in a certain president, a certain government, a certain outlook. And if that is in question, if that is under attack, if that is, for some of you, your faith was in a, you know, a sports team, a, in an outcome, in a relationship in another person. And I feel like our faith is, it's getting shaken. So the Bible doesn't call believing in Jesus as Messiah, as 
as healer, as deliverer. The Bible doesn't call other faiths faith. In fact, the Bible calls faith in Jesus the faith. At the time Christ walks the earth, there are plenty of temples, plenty of gods humans are worshiping, ways in which they are believing they will earn God's favor. Nobody worships a God just to worship a God. The actual intention of a human being to pursue something spiritual is that it would have an effect on the natural. And so it's true. That's how God created us, to see that the spiritual world has an impact on our natural world. But at the time Christ is walking the earth, there are many of faiths, you could say, many different religious activities taking place. But it was only recognized as faith in Scripture when it solely rested on Jesus. No matter how sick, hopeless, helpless. You know, for some people, the greatest miracle uh, in Christ's life was raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, I found it interesting that people overlook Zacchaeus a lot of the time. Uh, The Bible says it's easier for a a camel to go through the eye of a needle. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever tried to get anything through the eye of a needle. I can never even get a thread through the eye of a needle. Um, I, I can sit for 30 minutes trying to get, you know, a camel is impossible. Yet here is Zacchaeus, the most corrupt, greedy person in his entire region. And through one encounter with Jesus, receives salvation. Not just wisdom, salvation. He doesn't meet with Jesus to impress him. He knows Jesus knows all of his stuff. And he's so blown away that God this son of God would sit with him, dine with him. And on the other side of that ministry, Zacchaeus stands up and he's totally changed, right? But so much of this is about the bankruptcy of a human being, whether that was through their sickness, whether that was through their love of money, whether that was literally because they were dead, whether they had the issue of blood, whatever their issue was, it was not about their issue and the size of their issue. It was about the size of their expectation in Jesus. Can they get their problem to Jesus? And there were many people around Jesus that I believe had issues, but never came to Christ with the expectation he so desires and that he can change it for them. So I want to help you have faith that literally is placed on Christ because hope will be returned. For some of us, we're even questioning church, Christianity, our lives, because this year has not gone according to plan. I pray this prayer and God does that. I do this and God does this. Well, the thing is, if it's an expectation built on your outlook, your plan, your strategy, who's God in your life? Faith is in the goodness of God. And so I want to bring it there to start, actually, And I want to say this, um, let's change it around actually. Let's first start off with Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ. That's where we start. So do you believe you are to be crucified? Or do you believe Christ was crucified for you? That sounds like a simple question. But how many of us, in the outlook of our lives, expect ourselves to pay the price for us to reap the benefit. I'm not talking about hard work here. I'm talking about the subconscious mindset of, you know what, if the worse it is for me, fine, I'm, I'm carrying favor with God. That's not God's wisdom, that we kill ourselves, okay? I'm not saying that we're not productive. I'm saying we're productive, but it shouldn't kill us, okay? I have been crucified with Christ. He died, but he took me with him to the cross. My sin, my shame, my sickness, right? So therefore, now it is no longer I who live, but this is the spiritual truth. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the natural truth, and I'll show you how. It is no longer I who live, but in the spiritual realm, it is Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh I live by faith 
Not in my church attendance, necessarily. Not in how much everyone's proud of me. My faith, my expectation of fulfillment is in the Son of God. Where is your faith today? In you? How do you know if it's you? I'll explain it to you later. But you'll pick up today whether your faith is in Jesus or not. But I want to tie this together because look at how cool this is. Faith in the Son of God comes attached with a revelation. This Son of God is not just God. He is God who loves me. So it personalizes it. If I live by faith, right, that my flesh lines up with heaven's plan, my faith is not in myself. It is in the Son of God who loves me. How many of us right now are so scared of what's going on in our life because we feel unloved? We feel like we are not good enough. (laughs) We feel like we failed. And some of us, if not all of us, have had really rough years. This year has not been easy on our natural comfort zones. But do you understand God loves you? Scripture declares that a life of faith in Jesus is tied directly to the revelation, he loves you. And out of that love for you, did something about your situation. He gave himself for you. He offered himself. His love for you was so great, he just can't leave you where you are. He literally offers himself up as a sacrifice for you. Now look at the next statement. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died in vain. In other words, I can have all of what Jesus has done for me if I live a life of faith in him because I know he loves me And he gave himself for me. But if I live a life of faith in anything or one else, right? I set aside the grace of God. I set aside God's grace. Right now, you might have some areas in your life that feel like they're not graced. That feel like they're unfruitful. They feel like they are just stuck. They feel like you've failed. I want to ask you the question, do you feel like you've been carrying that or you've placed it on Jesus? In in fact, maybe grace is in vain because your faith for that has not been in Christ who died because he loved you, right? It has been Your faith has been in maybe a person or a thing or an outcome or a promotion or a possession. And really what's happened is you've said, I'm only valuable if I do that, have that, become that. If I get love from that person, I'll feel loved. If I have that happen, I'll feel accepted. If I achieve this, then I know God loves me. But do you understand the context of faith is that the son of God, right, loves you and died for you. You needed him to die for you because in your natural ability, you are not capable of doing anything. In Hebrews chapter four, verses 16 tells us to boldly come to the throne of God. And it describes to us that it is not a throne of just judgment, but a throne of grace, right? That we, who's we? The people approaching the throne of grace obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, those two words, mercy and grace, are interesting because you can literally say mercy is rest, peace, wholeness. If you look at the actual words, it's it's in those root words, and grace 
is divine favor. So when we approach the throne of God boldly with the expectation that we get God's rest and favor to do what? Help in a time of need. Can I say this? How many of us have withdrawn from the throne of grace because this year we thought, I've got to get it right. I've got to make this happen. I've got to step up. I've got to step out. And although there's nothing wrong with the desire to please the Lord, we have to be very careful that we place our performance at the center of our faith. You are not your performance. You are his performance. And the more you are focused on his performance, your performance gets stronger because you are not performing from your own strength with faith in yourself, your skills, your expertise. You are literally shifting gears and shifting the burden onto Jesus. Right? Look at this. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, right? Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and this is awesome, heaven is looking down, cheering us on. You know, so many people are saying to us, what's going on in the world? I think heaven is so excited to see what God's going to do in the middle of this, to see the church that will arise, to see the people who have faith in Jesus coming out on the other side of COVID. I have full expectation the church of Jesus Christ's, according to scripture, its best days are ahead. I, 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 full expectation, God's gonna do something greater than we've seen. Here's what it tells us to do, okay? Surrounded by a great crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Can I give you some of what this actually is saying? So if you look at the Greek, it's fascinating. That word for weight is burden. Lay aside every burden, right? Shift the burden off of us. Now, let's come on now. I think 2020 is the heaviest year that's ever existed in my lifetime, the heaviest. There is everything to worry about. Uh, how you're running your health, your finances, your family, everything's got burden, 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 heavy, dark. It's literally felt. The Bible tells us that as heaven is looking around us, as heaven is looking down upon us, what do we do? We lay aside every weight. And the word, therefore, the sin, which so easily ensnares us, that's not like, oh, uh, the sin, like just the obvious sin, like, oh, okay, my, my flesh or my this or my that or an addiction. No, the word, therefore, sin is everywhere we miss the mark. Everywhere we behave out of the flesh against who God's made us by the Spirit. So this is the thing. 2020 has just exposed in our lives where our flesh wants to go and the burden that comes with it. And what does it do? Those two things, the burden, right, and the fleshly brokenness, what does it do? It ensnares us. The Greek there is, it, it's, it, 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 it circles us. It gets us to be fenced in. Right now, when I talk to people all the time, do you know what they tell me? They tell me that they are overwhelmed, that they have nowhere to go, that they feel claustrophobic, that they feel closed in, that they feel there's no way out. That is because they are carrying the weight and they are ensnared with the brokenness. That is what it is to live by the flesh. That is what it is to live with a faith in our ability. It says to us, lay it aside. And what's so cool about this is there's scripture to tell us what that means. And when we lay it aside, there's an instruction for us. So how do we lay it aside? Very easy. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And we have a whole sermon on this. Everybody in this church that has been here for a while will know about it. How to walk in supernatural rest, how to shift your yoke onto Jesus. But here's the thing. Jesus came not just for one purpose, but for a wholeness, a full life. And he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Now, people believe that this is like, I will give you a break, a vacation, time off. So, so give me your burden, I'll hold it. You go have three weeks vacation. When you come back, I'll put it back on you. No, it is a constant conscious decision to take what the devil and the world places on you and shift it to Jesus. My performance to his performance. My ability to his ability. So when he tells us, give me those things that are a burden to you, that those things are, are a struggle to you and I will give you rest, that language for rest is not just a break, it's actually victory. The promised land in the Old Testament was not called the land of Canaan, it was called the land of rest. So we, in order to walk in victory, need to understand that rest is an activity of heaven. It is not I cease activity, it is actually I walk in greater victory. Because what's happening, you are giving the burden, you are giving the pressure of performance to him. And you are receiving from him his yoke. He says, take my yoke, right, upon you. Lean and learn, right? I am gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, when you hear this, you might think Christianity, following Jesus means I, I never have a life of significance. On the contrary, the followers of Jesus in scripture that walked in his rest changed the world. I mean, there's record in scripture of Jesus' disciples as shadows healing people. There is record of <laughs> resurrections and, and literally the most unbelievable miracles. But that is because they had to shift the performance off of themselves onto Jesus. They had to literally live a life so let's just go back to Hebrews chapter 12, verses one and two. Let's finish that conversation of shifting, laying aside every weight and the sin which surrounds us, right? We put that, you know, when Jesus hung on the cross, the language prophetically of what that would look like as captured in the Old Testament is literally like my enemies, like dogs. They, in, they encircle me, they surround me. Right? It's prophesied that Jesus would be surrounded, that Jesus would carry every weight, right? That Jesus would literally be cornered by sin. Not that he knew sin, but that our sin literally ensnared him at the cross to the point of cutting him off from being in covenant with God, in relationship with God. So when we shift that to him, what does it free us to do? Let us run with endurance, the race set before us. The devil wants to neutralize and paralyze you from the race that God has desired for you to run. Something I keep laying at the feet of Jesus is, God, help me to overcome my insecurity so that I run my race, not someone else's race so that I'm not looking in comparison at what someone else is called to do and trying to do that, because that's not a burden on my shoulders. That is not something for me to do. There is a grace for the race God has set before me. And if I function from a faith that positions myself at the center, I'll try and run everyone else's race because I am seeking approval because I feel I have yet to perform. But if I place my faith on Jesus and I put his performance, which is complete at the center of my faith, now I can run the race with grace set before me. How? Looking unto Jesus, verse two, the author and the finisher. You cannot run a race for the favor of God better than the race Jesus ran for you. In fact, he began it and he completed it. 
He lived a perfect life from birth unto death. In his story is your history. He, he literally already got you the ultimate standing with God. So we do not run this race for grace, for favor. We run this race from grace, from favor. And then you can run with endurance. And what's so amazing, it describes that when Jesus went to the cross, he did so with joy because he knew he would take what life wants to burden you with that you can't deal with, that you can't fix, that you can't change. What is that? Shame, sickness, all the stuff that this life wants to throw at you based on your performance. Jesus took joy knowing that it's set before him, not you. The devil comes and he sets that in front of you. And he says, you got to go to the cross. You got to overcome your shame. You got to deal with all your weakness. You got to fix yourself. No, no, no. God said it before Jesus and it gave him joy because then he could set in front of us what? That burden that is light and easy. That yoke that is a pleasure to run with. That is light that we literally yoked with God can run this race full of expectation. How? Looking unto Jesus. It doesn't say looking to Jesus. It says looking unto Jesus. It's a small little phrase, but it's significant because it shifts it from I see Jesus to all I see is Jesus. God doesn't want you to see Jesus, see your problem, see your rejections, see your failures, see your shortcomings, see your fears. He wants you to only see Jesus, because then you will only see your fulfillment of perfection, that you see yourself complete and loved and valuable and precious. And then you don't need to go into a room and impress someone and try and keep something and grow something and build something in your own strength. No, you see Jesus and you see he began it, he'll complete it. He promised it, he'll fulfill it. I, I, I don't need to perform my way into this, but I can say this, I can run this race set before me. God set before Jesus the cross, the shame, all that he would have to endure. And in the same scripture, one back, he sets before you a race that he's graced you. To run. Jesus says, I'm happy. I'm full of joy to see what's set before me because as I fulfill what is set before me, you can fulfill what is set before you. It's so important to just get this right. Our faith is in Jesus. You know what faith is? Taking from God. Simple. I don't have it. You do. I need it. You have it in bucket loads. Uh, I don't feel accepted. I don't feel loved. I don't feel valued. I don't feel like I'm achieving. I don't feel like I have it all together. <laughs> uh, I don't feel like I can make it another day. But you know what? Then you come to that throne of grace so that you can obtain mercy and favor, mercy and grace. It's not just God loves you where you are. If we literally go back there, I want to show you this. It's not Hebrews 4, 16. God doesn't leave you a victim. God doesn't leave you paralyzed in your circumstance. He doesn't leave you where you are like, how am I going to do this? No. Once you obtain mercy and grace, it is a help. Literally there, the Greek is mercy is, is like a peace and a wholeness. And the grace there is favor. That word for grace that is written there is all over the New Testament and divinely linked to victory. Put our faith in Jesus. It sounds so simple. It sounds so silly to be talking about it today, but you know what? How many of us right now, wherever there is a shaking in your life, it is because your eyes, you're looking unto something other than him. It's not I see Jesus and everything else. Looking unto Jesus is all I see is Jesus. So I, I, I don't know where you're at today. And I don't know what you're facing, but I want to lead you in a moment of prayer. I, I want us to be vulnerable.
to come to that throne today. Because why? God has all you need in bucket loads. He, he so loves you that he died for you. And I'm not just talking to unbelievers. I wanna say to believers, you might've been in church your whole life and you're living with disappointment right now. You might be living with discouragement right now. That's not the life God's called you to live. God has a race that he has graced you for. Place your faith back onto him and only him today. Shift your faith from people. Maybe I've disappointed you. Maybe our church leadership have disappointed you. Maybe your spouse has disappointed you. Your best friend has disappointed you. Maybe even the worst thing is you've disappointed yourself this year. Maybe you feel like you are just a failure and nowhere. That is not who Jesus made you by his life, his death, his resurrection. That is not where God wants you living. And I'm telling you today, that is an evil demonic plan to get you to walk away from the race God has graced you to run. You are so needed. You are so valuable and your life on this earth has a plan and a purpose. It is the devil who says, give up. It is the devil who says, you failed. But God has never left you and he hasn't forsaken you. And wherever you're watching, in whatever context, I'm standing here today to testify to you, it's not over. In fact, I believe as we place our faith on Jesus, our best days are ahead in Jesus' name. Your brightest days are ahead in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for each and every single person watching right now. Lord Jesus, you love them so much. You care for them so much that you died for them. Father, right now, let them know your love. Let them sense your closeness. Nothing separates us from your love. No sin, no failure. In fact, you died to actually heal us from all of those things. Father, I pray today they hear the voice of heaven. They hear the words of the Holy Spirit speaking life, faith, hope, and a purpose into them. It's not over. It's just the beginning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right now, I want to invite each and every single person watching that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We're going to lead you in the prayer of faith that changed everybody's life forever. What do I mean? The prayer that invites Christ to be our Lord and Savior. Jesus has already declared his love for you. God has already declared his love for you. Christ has already demonstrated the love of him, of literally God for you by dying on the cross and being raised again from the dead for your sin, for your brokenness. He can't wait to save you. But God is a God of love and true love is when two people, two parties, they choose each other. God's already chosen you, died for you. And he cannot wait for you to allow him to save you. He's waiting for you to choose him. I'm not talking about a lifetime of religious commitments. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus. He so desires to move with grace and love in your life. I prayed this prayer years back and I wasn't perfect and I'm still not perfect, but I experienced the love that was supernatural. And today, people all over the world live a life knowing Jesus because they've allowed him in. If you're watching today and you don't know Christ, you don't know Jesus. You, you tuned in, you invited and you've hung around till this time. That's not by mistake. That's a divine appointment for God to save you. He so wants you to know his love through Christ, his salvation through Jesus. So would you pray with us right now? 
All you have to do is just repeat with me these words. Believe them in your heart. Pray them with your lips. I know your life will never be the same again. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you shedding your blood for me. Today, Jesus, come into my life. Be my savior. Change me. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. I believe you love me. You died for me and you washed all my sin away. Today, I believe Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time ever, we want to celebrate with you. We want to send you a bunch of resources and tell you more about Jesus. Completely free. It's a gift from us to you. Would you just let us know that you prayed? We want to celebrate with you. We're so excited for what God's going to do in your life. On the screen right now is a whole bunch of information, maybe relevant to your nation, your country, your language. Would you just let us know by responding below? Or you can even comment if you're watching online on social media, say, I prayed that prayer. I'm praying that prayer for the first time. I believed in Jesus for the first time today. And our team will reach out and see how we can get you more information on how much Jesus loves you. What a precious, precious moment. Your life will never be the same. We're gonna receive communion together. This is where we literally place our faith in Jesus for our healing, remind ourselves of his love for us. And so we do that with bread and with juice, whatever liquid you can get, whatever kind of bread, crackers you can get to be his body broken for us, his blood that was shed for us. We all do this as often as is necessary according to scripture. And right now with sickness where it's at and depression and hopelessness and helplessness at its highest, even more so do we need to remind ourselves who we are because of what Jesus went through at the cross. So if you can just take out your bread and we're gonna declare what Christ has done for us today. Regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what's going on, our faith is placed on Jesus. So take this bread and as we break it, we speak over it, we say, this is the body of Jesus broken for me by every stripe, every whip, every lash on his body, I am healed. We break this and we receive healing in our homes, healing in our lives, healing in Jesus' name supernaturally, greater than sickness, greater than suffering. Our faith is in Jesus today. We thank you for that, Lord. The blood of Jesus shed for us. You know, this life on earth, it's actually not the main, it's not the main show. It's not the main event. It's just a icebreaker. It's just a little taste. And the most amazing thing about the blood of Jesus is it gives us an eternal righteousness. Do you know that forever God sees you according to the value of what Jesus is to him. You are so loved, so cherished, and there is nothing you can do to mess that up. So as we receive today a reminder of the blood of Jesus for us, let our hearts be filled with faith. God is with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Greater than every weakness, greater than every failure. And let us have faith for the future. The blood of Jesus shed for us declares us righteous, pleasing, perfect, and whole. Receive. Thank you, Jesus, for everybody out there right now, Father, that is reminded again of how good you are, but we declare, Lord Jesus, every need is met. Every miracle comes through what you have paid the price for. We declare in homes, lives, minds, that it be brought into line with Christ, healthy, whole, perfect and pleasing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. As we talk about finances, what's so fascinating about the word of God is it doesn't deny finances. In fact, God actually says, I know what you need. And even he says, if you would trust me in this, if you would test me in this, would I not open the heaven? Would I not open literally the favor of God to flow? Right now, more than ever, I think we need favor in our finances. We need them to be graced. Do you know that in scripture, the word seed is called Zara. Don't come with all your shopping thoughts right now. Um, but it's interesting, the seed word Zara changes from when it's a seed in the hand of a person or literally a seed that is sitting wherever, on a table. But the moment it is sown into the ground where a seed is placed in the environment to multiply, it's still called Zara, but it's a different spelling. In fact, in the hand of a person, it is Z-A-R-A, -A, but in the ground, as it multiplies into a fruitful seed, it is Z-A-R-A-H. It gets graced. H is the letter that is grace in Hebrew, right? It is a hay. And a seed is graced to grow when it's sown. We want grace for multiplication. Father, I thank you that as we give of our tithes and offerings today, our faith is in Jesus, our provider, our CEO. <laughs> we thank you, Jesus, that we give not out of fear, but in faith, not out of manipulation, but revelation. God is greater God is better, God is bigger than our natural minds could ever conceive. We speak supernatural provision over every household and home as they place their faith in a supernatural God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All the ways that you can give are up on the screen. However you give, we're so grateful that you're a part of this incredible church. And I cannot wait to see you again I can't wait to see, you know, in 2021 as we can gather again. But for now, let's shift our faith back onto Jesus. Keep growing in that, keep applying it. And I truly believe the best days are ahead in Jesus' name. We love you, Redemption Church. We'll see you again next week. Until then, be blessed.